Greetings. I'm speaking to you during the football season. And some of you may have heard the story about the football coach that was having trouble with a vending machine. He, he could be overheard saying, give me my quarterback. Hope you like that little story. You know, I liked, I'd like to think of myself as one who's being helpful in bringing out insights from God's Word, from the Holy Bible. As Christians, we're set apart by our faithfulness to the Word of God for our desire to live according to the inspired Word of God that we find in the Scriptures. Uh, Jesus Christ prayed for the church before his arrest uh, in John 17, 17. And he said, sanctify them. He prayed for his people now and in the future, or then and in the future. And he said, Thank sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So we are set apart by the fact that we try to live our lives according to to the scriptures. Now the scriptures are organized in a particular way and I'd like to talk about that today. My topic today is biblical fundamentals. I want to give you some key verses, thematic verses from each of the sections of the Bible as we as the Bible is laid out and organized. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14 uh, and verse 40 uh, uh, Paul writes, uh, it would be good if I were in 1 Corinthians. Right now I'm in 2 Corinthians. He writes in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 and verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now there's an order and an organization to the scriptures, and I'm just going to skim the surface of that today. But we understand that the scriptures were given, the Hebrew and Aramaic scriptures, to the Jewish community, those who utilize those languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, and the Greek, the New Testament, which was written in Greek, you know, was given to the Greek-speaking world to preserve. So the Jews have preserved the Old Testament for us and the Greeks have preserved the New Testament for us. We understand from Romans 1 and Romans 2 to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the Jewish community in the time of Christ, of course, was spread out, and there was a major community in Alexandria speaking Greek. But Jesus came to the land of Israel, and uh, he focused on Jerusalem. And he tells us in Matthew 23... In the beginning of that chapter, we're told Then Jesus spoke to the multitude, multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So yeah, they're going to read the scriptures to you. You'll come to the synagogue and they copy the scriptures and they read the scriptures and you listen and you do you know what the what the bible says but don't copy the example of the of the scribes and pharisees that's sad but uh, there was a responsibility given uh, to the jewish community to preserve the bible the old testament uh, in, in the hebrew and aramaic scriptures and eventually of course a canon developed of new testament scriptures given to the greek speaking world and they have preserved those. Now in Luke 24 and verse 44, you see a, a, an indication, it's not a proof, but an indication of the threefold division of the scriptures as the Hebrew speaking world has preserved them. Uh, in Luke 24 and verse 44, we see uh, Jesus expounding on his, on his identity uh, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. 
the law and uh, the prophets and the Psalms. Now, the way a Hebrew Bible is organized today, uh, the third section uh, it, it begins with the Psalms, which are a major part of that entire third section of the Bible. The way the Jews have preserved the Bible uh, is in three sections, the law, the Torah, the prophets, the Nevi'im, and the writings, the hagiographer, the holy writings, Ketuvim, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, and so it's called Tanakh. It's also called the Holy Scriptures, Kitve HaKodesh, and you even have that expression in, in, Second, Timothy, in Second Timothy. But we normally, it's called the Tanakh. Now, if you look at the New Testament, uh, if you look at the, uh, let, let's put it another way for a moment. Uh, the, the Old Testament, you can organize the material in terms of 22 books. I understand that, you know, normally the translation that you're using divides them up into 39, but they could be divided up into 22, uh, as Josephus records in the first century for the 22 uh, specific symbols of the Hebrew alphabet that you find in the acrostic passages of Scripture. And I, I don't want to go into a whole exposition on that today, but you can have 22 books of the Old Testament. Then you can have 27 of the New for the 24 letters of the Greek alphabet plus three additional letters that were used as numerals. So you have 27. So you have 22 27, which makes 49 altogether, or 7 times 7. So now you have the complete the complete canon. And uh, in one sense, the center of it is a New Testament Pentateuch. You have the Pentateuch of the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, the Chumash. But you also have, in the center of the Bible, you have the Pentateuch, the New Testament Pentateuch, Gospels and Acts. So you have the 22 books of the Old Testament and then 22 books of the New and in the center, Gospels and Acts. And in the, really in the center of the Bible, you have the, the key passage, Acts 9, 3, 19 through 21, which I hope to read to you later on. However, it's possible to break the New Testament up into actually um, five sections. You, you can have the Gospels, Jesus Christ's ministry, and ultimately his martyrdom and resurrection. Then, of course, we have the resurrected Christ beginning the church in the book of Acts. So you have Gospels and Acts, and then you have the Pauline epistles, and I would say 14 of them because we don't know the author of Hebrews, but the, the style and content of Hebrews is similar to the, to the other 13 epistles that we attribute to Paul. So 14 would make sense, 14 Pauline epistles, and then seven general epistles, and then Revelation. So five parts to the New Testament. And the Old Testament, the three overall divisions, can be broken up into seven parts. And the, the Old Testament does that at times. It starts out with three generic categories and then breaks it down to seven parts. You see that with the festivals. You see that with God's uh, proposal to uh, Israel in Hosea, the second chapter. Again, I'm just referring to that as just evidence of what I want to do. So let's say there are now seven sections of the Old Testament. You have the law, and then you have the former prophets. Then you have the, ma the latter prophets, but there are two divisions of those, uh, the major and the minor. You know? And then you have uh, a, the, the writings, which are, bro which, which are broken into the wisdom, poetry and wisdom section, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, the five festival scrolls, and then the latter restoration books, uh, which, uh, which uh, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah as one long book, First, Second Chronicles as one long book. Now you come up with twenty-two if you put all that together, uh, and I'll go through that, explain it, how it goes, and why the Jews today say there are twenty-four. Uh, obviously, it would make sense to them to have twenty-four because then they wouldn't be looking for any additional books. If you have twenty-two, you might want to be looking for an additional. A collection which we have. <laughs> we have the 22 books to the Old Testament, 27 of the New. Anyway, let's uh, go through the sections of the Bible and, and, and cover a thematic passage from each section, a key, a key passage from each section. First, we have the five books of law, the Torah. And of course, if I'm talking about the Torah, uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to go to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. This is so critical. 
and you find it repeated in the New Testament, of course. And so I go to the uh, to the Shema here. <laughs> so I go to Deuteronomy six and verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Eternal our God, the Eternal is one. You know, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And of course, the original is YHWH, probably pronounced Yahweh. You shall love the Lord your God with all your. I'm reading from Deuteronomy 6 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. <clears throat> and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You know, we just heard the Ten Commandments repeated in Deuteronomy 5. And you shall, te you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, you don't have to necessarily read that in a, in a literal way. You have other verses that show you you could take this in a more figurative sense that they need, they need to guide your actions and your thoughts your goals, your hopes, your dreams should be guided by the word of God and your actions, right? You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So your very re uh, residences should reflect, you know, the will of God as, as, as you, as you uh, build society and as you, you live uh, in society. You should be living according to the word of God. So this is, of course a key and you find this of, uh, initially of course you find this elsewhere in the Bible but I'm reading it now out of Deuteronomy 6 I read the passage from the fourth verse to the ninth verse very critically important passage of Scripture now you come to the former prophets and uh, there are really two books of the former prophets Joshua and Judges is one long book uh, and uh, when I was a student in Yeshiva University uh, in my long time ago, we had a textbook, and it was one book, Joshua Judges. Uh, however, uh, in order for there to be 24 books now rather than 22, uh, when Jews count, they count Joshua and Judges separate. They also count Samuel and Kings separate. But really, Samuel and Kings could be thought of as one long book, first, second, third, and fourth Kings. In other words, Joshua and Judges represent Israel before the monarchy. And uh, first, second, third, and fourth kings. That book is Israel under the monarchy. So let's go to Joshua uh, and the uh, the Joshua Judges section, and I want to there read from uh, the. In other words, this is the the former prophets. Uh, I want to read from uh, Joshua twenty four and verse fifteen. So here we have Joshua Judges and, and Samuel and Kings, the former prophets. And I read from Joshua 24 and verse 15. And Joshua is speaking here to the children of Israel. If it seems evil to you to serve the Eternal, choose for yourselves this day whom you shall serve. You think it's difficult to be a, you know, a, a God-fearing person? Well, it's actually, it's more difficult not to be, ultimately. <laughs> and if, if it seems evil to you to serve the Eternal, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, the Euphrates, or, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Eternal. So it comes down to that, you know. As for me and my house... We will serve the eternal. And so that's really a very important theme for the uh, former prophets. Now you have the latter prophets, which are divided into major and minor, uh, because the major are three large books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And the minor are 12 books, which are combined as one in Hebrew. They're called the Treasar, the Twelve because some of them are only, like one of them is only one chapter long, Obadiah. Most of the books are not that long, so it's handier to keep them all on one scroll. So, but let's go to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And so uh, 
let's go to Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. And here you see a promise of a new covenant. In other words, the Old Testament already promises, of course, there's going to be a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the day, now Hebrews, the book of Hebrews explains the need for the new covenant. It's because of, of human beings. We need God's spirit. We need to have that connection to God spiritually. We need conversion, each of us. Uh, Hebrews, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Eternal, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant uh, I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Eternal. So as Hebrew says, the problem is with people, not with the covenant. <laughs> but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Eternal. I'll put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Kind of going back to Deuteronomy, but now fulfilling it. All right. There's more to to the story, though. It's nice to 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 be walking on the right path, but what about your your what you have done? You need forgiveness for that, and what you might do later, uh, even though you're generally going to be keeping God's law, but you may stumble now and then. What happens then? And you will stumble now and then because you're human. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Eternal, know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this really summarizes the, import, the critical importance of the new covenant God promised he would make with Israel. Yes, he will make it with Israel. And it begins in Acts uh, 2 in Jerusalem with devout Jews. And later on, I, I believe that it also spread to descendants, or at least some descendants of the lost tribes of the northern kingdom. But as we also understand from the, from the New Testament, it spread uh, uh, to the Gentile world and ultimately uh, for a time in history, uh, often has been in the history of the church predominantly uh, Gentile. God, of course, is working with the entire human race. He begins with Israel, and from there, ultimately, he, he intends to save all of humankind. But he has a plan, a program, uh, as we understand if we keep the festival days, the appointed times from year to year, it helps remind us of that plan. But as we read the Bible, we'll see that he begins with Israel but expands to all of humankind. So that's the major prophets. And now we want to go to the minor prophets. And there we come to the last one of them, preparing you know, the way for the future. We come to Malachi, my messenger, my messenger or messenger of the eternal. And uh, Malachi, uh, in the last chapter... What does this final prophet of Old Testament times remind tell us to do as he you know winds up as the message concludes Remember the law of Moses my servant <coughs> excuse me which I commanded him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and judgments Now unfortunately you know we speak of still the Judeo-Christian heritage and that has been, of course, traditionally how we've described the moral uh, heritage, the religious heritage, the spiritual heritage of the Western world. We speak of the Judeo-Christian heritage. But I would say, unfortunately, many people who would call themselves, if you ask them you know, to define themselves in terms of religion, they might say Jewish. If you ask them, to, or they might say Christian. But do they remember 
the law of Moses and the uh, statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the eternal. So this prophecy looks forward to the day of the eternal and to the coming of an Elijah whose purpose will be to restore a, a knowledge and, and practice of God's way of life uh, bef before the uh, coming of Jesus Christ, the, before the, the coming of the Messiah, which we understand the second coming of Christ, so that there is, in fact, a faithful remnant on earth to welcome him, you know, and uh, to uh, prepare the way before him. And he will turn this Elijah that's coming, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So, the, you know, the saving of the earth is because there's a chosen remnant uh, who are Christian commandment keepers in the generic sense, you know, of that term. Okay, so this uh, catches us up to this point. We have the law, we have the... Um, former prophets, we have the major prophets, we have the minor prophets, all right? And uh, there are three other sections uh, of the Old Testament. We have the poetry and wisdom, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, and Job. And uh, I want to go now to the, in what in one sense is the final book of, final chapter of Psalms, the 145th. We have then an appendix of five Psalms, uh, it, it co coordinated with the five books of Psalms and with the five books of the law and with the five festival scrolls. So in one sense, the end of the book of Psalms is in Psalm 145, and it's an acrostic psalm. It's alphabetically organized. It's a very thorough, complete discussion about God focusing on his kingdom, and it, and it, and it, include, and it concludes this way. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. So there, that's a, that's a appropriate theme for the for the poetry and wisdom uh, literature. Then we have the five festival scrolls, and uh, I want to go to the fourth one because it seems to me that would be a way of summarizing the message of the five festival scrolls. I want to go to uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, the twelfth chapter, as we conclude the book of Ecclesiastes. So, um, let me just, if, for some of you who may be new to this, uh, I don't want you to leave uh, unsatisfied as far as how I'm counting the 22 books. So we have the five books of the law, we have the Joshua judges and Samuel and kings. So we have the two for, uh, former prophets, and then we have three major prophets, and then we have um, the uh, minor prophets. Okay, so we have five books of the law, two books of the former prophets, that's seven, right? And then we have uh, three books of the major prophets, that's 10, and we have the minor prophets, that's 11. Now, there are also 11 books of the writings. Okay, we have Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. We have the five festival scrolls. Uh, we have Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, uh, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. And then we have the latter restoration books, which is Daniel, Samuel, and Kings, uh, and uh, Chronicles. So that gives 11, and that's altogether 22. So I hope that, I, I, I don't want you to be unsatisfied. The New Testament books you can easily name, the 27 that are, that are there delineated in most translations. So now I want to go to Ecclesiastes 12, and it says, let us hear the conclusion, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay, <laughs> this is really what we need to be understand. You know, there is a God, and we're accountable to God. Okay, then uh, we go to the um, latter restoration books, and there uh, I want to go to uh, 
Second Chronicles, which is the last book of the Old Testament when the way it's organized in Hebrew Bibles. And uh, I go to Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter, the 20th verse. Uh, in other words, this is 2020 vision from a biblical point of view. All right. So here we go on Second Chronicles 2020. Uh, so they arose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Jehoshaphat means the eternal has judged. He's the king at that time. Jehoshaphat, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the eternal your God, and you shall be established. This is a play on words, right? Uh, Haminu uh, v'shem Adonai v'teamenu. Believe in the eternal your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Okay? Believe in the eternal your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Okay, so I want to go now to the New Testament and go to the Gospels, you know, to covering Jesus' ministry and his uh, finally his resurrection. And that's where he is, that's where he's standing now, you know, at the right hand of the Father, waiting to return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I want to go to John 3 and verse 16 and 17 that you all know. I would say this is thematic of the Gospels. For God, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And now, a pivotal, very pivotal scripture in the entire Bible, Acts 3, 19-21. We go, I'm going out to Acts the third chapter, 19 to 21. So these verses I'm giving you today, these are what you would call memory verses. These are verses that you ought to be fluent with. Maybe I'm not saying you have to know them word for word, but you could at least paraphrase these verses. You know, they should come to mind. They should be part of your, uh, your, your database, <laughs> your scripture vocabulary. Acts 3, 19 to 21. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. You know, you can go back, you know, you have Enoch and Noah and so forth. Okay, now we want to go to the epistles of Paul or the Pauline epistles. And of course, <laughs> a lot of material there, but I want to go to Romans 6.23, which is a very good summary, I would say, of what Paul wants us to understand. And the author of Hebrews, uh, who may, may, yeah, may have been Paul, you know, or he may have had a hand in it. Uh, anyway, uh, verse six, uh, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So if we are incorrigibly wicked, we will not live. We will be extinct. <laughs> we will be annihilated. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, because it is God in his mercy has given us this opportunity to be saved, to be, to be uh, sharing eternity with him as spirit beings. This is a gift that we could not earn. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I would think of that as a wonderful summary of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now we have the seven general epistles. And I would go there to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter, and a passage that is a very powerful passage to uh, that I want to share with you uh, today as I as I talk about the the uh, biblical fundamentals. These are fundamental verses. These are thematic verses from each of the 12 sections of the Bible that I'm going through here. The seven sections of the Old Testament and the five sections of the New. I'm now on the fourth section of the New Testament, the way I've done it. Gospels, Acts, Pauline epistles, general epistles, and of course I'm going to finish with the book of Revelation. You're not in suspense about that. Uh, anyway, I go to 1 John 3. 
Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And therefore what? Uh, we're motivated to obey Jesus Christ, as it says in verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So these scriptures, I would say, summarize each of these various sections of the Bible. You know, it's like the famous story about Hillel. You know, a, a, a Gentile went to Hillel and wanted him to, to teach him the whole law while he was standing on one leg. So he said to him, you know, You know, uh, what is hateful to you, don't do to your fellow, fellow human being. He said to him, this is the, the law, as, as, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12, right, the golden rule. This is the law, the rest is commentary. Then he said, go and learn. So what I'm giving you today is the basics, the basic fundamentals. And now, of course, all of us are required to go and learn, go and study. Uh, we want to go to Revelation now, or I do, and I hope you'll join me. And uh, I want to go to the 21st ver uh, chapter. And, uh, of course, I often read these verses, but we need to keep these verses in mind. This passage in Revelation 21, where is history going? Now I say, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Everything is different. Everything has changed for the better. <laughs> now I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these are true, for these uh, words are true and faithful. So this is a very important uh, summary of the message of this book, the final book of the Bible. And I hope that going through this today has been helpful to you, and maybe I've whet your appetite to dig in a little more into the structure and organization and design of the Bible. I want to let you know that I'll be doing a seminar on this subject excuse me, in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, at the end of December, and I would hope that that might be recorded and made available uh, over time. But I want to finish today by going to the end of the book of Revelation and uh, coming to the, uh, the final passage here. I'm going to Revelation 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All the best to you and yours.